A Bali Mina sings in the top of a tree, flinging its snow-white crest back and forth. Perched nearby, a Guam Kingfisher passively watches it from its perch. On the forest floor, an Edwards pheasant struts among the understory vegetation, and a pink pigeon drinks from a small pool of water. All of this is remarkable. Bali Mina are incredibly rare with fewer than 100 adults flying wild on their Indonesian island. The Guam kingfisher is completely extinct in the wild, devoured by tree snakes introduced to their island after World War II. Edward's pheasants have become incredibly rare in the wild in the wake of the Vietnam War, and has not been seen in the wild for some time. The pink pigeon, hailing from the island of Mauritius, where the dodo was from, was once down to ten individual birds. But today flies wild again and is no longer endangered, now downlisted as a vulnerable species. All of these birds only exist today through the hard and critical work of zoos and other ex situ conservation programs. Ex situ comes from Latin and means off-site. Anytime a conservation program happens outside the wild habitat of a species, it is considered ex situ. This differentiates it from in situ conservation where work is done in the native range of a species. When natural habitat becomes disturbed by deforestation, overhunting, or invasive species, ex situ offers backups to populations and maintains genetic diversity to reintroduce to a population. The most conventional way of doing this kind of conservation are in zoos, aquariums, and botanical gardens. The keeping of wild animals in captivity has a long history. Royalty around the world have maintained menageries of animals since ancient times. Around the Enlightenment, some of these once exclusive displays of royal wealth and power began being open to the public, eventually resulting in what we might recognize as a modern zoo in the early 19th century. Beyond displaying animals for entertaining the masses of an urbanizing Europe, they also became important places to study animals and natural history. Then, around the middle of the 20th century, the loss of species and then public interest in ecology and preserving nature began changing zoos to make conservation an important part of their mission statements. This paradigm shift from royal collection to being focused on conservation and education has meant the modern zoological garden is very different from the old idea of just trying to get as many animal kinds into the smallest and simplest enclosures possible. Today, these institutions strive for higher standards of care and accreditation through associations. In the United States, there is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the AZA. Canada has the CAZA, or Canada's Accredited Zoos and Aquariums, and there are such accreditation programs all over the world, and even the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, who helps coordinate efforts between them. To become a member, these facilities must have a very high standard of care, with specific protocols on training, feeding, and enrichment, that should stimulate these species' natural behaviors. A quick aside, not all zoos are accredited. In the U.S., only around 10% of zoos are members of the AZA, and not all of these non-accredited zoos uphold such high standards. And if an accredited zoo drops below a certain standard or fails to comply with best practices or certain policies, they forfeit accreditation. That said, some very good institutions either are still in the multi-year process of accreditation or despite dropping out of an association because of a policy disagreement, still maintain high standards of care and continue important conservation work. One of the most important pieces of ex situ conservation done by these associations is developing and implementing breeding plans. In the AZA, they are called SSPs, or Species Survival Plans. Across the Atlantic, there are European Endangered Species Programs, EEPs, and so on in other parts of the world. In the AZA, a species survival plan basically creates one unified plan to save a particular species between all members of the association. This involves maintaining genetic diversity, doing valuable research, educating people on the species, reintroductions, and even sending zoo professionals out to work on in situ projects. Maintaining genetic variation within the entire captive population is important to help maintain genes to be returned to the wild populations later and is managed through something called a stud book. This means animals under the jurisdiction of a particular association are moved around to other member institutions to make sure unrelated individuals are being bred 
avoiding inbreeding issues and making the captive population effectively function as a single larger population. Stud books are maintained by a single zoo professional who tracks every member of a particular species in their pedigree in all member institutions. The goal is to reach a target captive population that can maintain 90% of the current diversity for the next 100 years. Plant conservation is a little different, with some specimens held at botanical gardens, but often seeds are kept in seed banks and their tissue frozen. The San Diego Zoo maintains a frozen zoo, with frozen tissue, sperm, and eggs from animals for future use. This can also be used to preserve tissue of species that go extinct for potential de-extinction. One animal it may be necessary to do this for is the northern white rhinoceros, which I had the opportunity to see at the San Diego Zoo's Wild Animal Park back in 2010. This individual named Angelifu was one of the last two males of his kind until his death in 2014, and as of 2020, only two females moved from a Czech zoo live, under protection of armed guards in a Kenyan wildlife sanctuary. Ex situ conservation, though, is not perfect and has its fair share of issues. In captivity, animals are not undergoing the same selection pressures, so traits that could make animals less fit for the wild can be passed around in a captive population. This is why it is important to closely replicate a species' natural habitat, but also carefully manage genetics. One way around this is to manage the captive population as several smaller populations with just enough crossover to avoid inbreeding. There is also some discussion if ex situ projects distract from other conservation work and eat up valuable conservation dollars due to its expense. It is clearly not an end-all be-all and really must be done in conjunction with in situ conservation to make sure these animals have a place to go. So ex situ is usually seen as a last resort redundant population in case of a worst case scenario, but also potentially a valuable source of genetic variation that can be put back into the wild. Ex situ programs, though, have proven to be successful. The mighty California condor, with the largest wingspan of any North American bird, survived the extinction of the megafauna at the end of the last ice age, only to nearly go extinct in the 20th century due to synthetic chemicals dumped into the environment. And by 1987, only 22 existed. So in a last resort, they were all rounded up and brought into an ex situ conservation program. After a few years of captive breeding, it was time to try and return these birds to the wild. In 1991, some were released on the California coast, and then in 1996, more were released on the Vermilion Cliffs near the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Slowly, their population has risen, and you can see these mighty birds soaring along the rugged California coast, or by Red Rock Cliffs, or more likely perched under Navajo Bridge. Their recovery has not been completely smooth, Lead poisoning from hunter's bullets that fragment inside game have really slowed the return of the condor. But with an outreach program, this is actually going down. So hopefully, these important scavengers are due for a rapid population increase. Ex situ conservation is a very important tool in conservation. I didn't even bring up the value zoos give besides ex situ, especially their educational value. This video is part of an ongoing Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series with a new episode coming out each and every month. So if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell so you can be notified when the next video in this series comes out. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it.